Hello and welcome to The Rabbit Atheist. I'm Ed Raby, a former pastor turned atheist, now a compassionate anti-theist. Welcome to my channel. Subscribe and join The Rabbit Nation. Uh, if you want to learn more about our uh, mission to normalize atheism and deconversion and how to support that, stay tuned to the end of the video to learn more. Today I'm reacting to Frank Turek and his video, How to Prove the Resurrection in Less Than Two Minutes. Well, folks, if this is true, then I will be shutting down my channel in less than an hour because of this proof and returning to Christianity. But let's see what Frank has to say before we jump the gun. There's only two possibilities when it comes to the resurrection. He, it either happened or it didn't happen. Oh boy, we're going to have a flow chart. Well, yeah, that is the case of all miracle claims. It either happened or it didn't. Miracles, by definition, are a suspension of the natural order, and as such, I think Hume's rules apply that we need to be in a situation there is no alternative or no other alternative that can be accepted other than the miracle has taken place. So what are we going to see in two minutes that gives us no alternative other than to conclude that Jesus rose from the dead? Right? If it happened, then Jesus is Lord. You've heard Lord Liar Lunatic, right? Okay, he's the Lord. Okay. What? No, that doesn't prove that he is Lord. That's an assertion. Let's see, we have the widow's son at Nain, Jarius' daughter, Lazarus, an unknown number of people resurrected at the time of Jesus' crucifixion. Why doesn't their resurrection say that they were lords or something special about them? The fact is that Christians do this quick special pleading about the resurrection of Jesus uh, as somehow more special than the rest of them. But a whole bunch of people are resurrected in the story. Resurrections are actually quite common. The point that is, even if Jesus was raised from the dead, all it was proved that some power he had been risen from the dead. We have multiple characters in Scripture rising from the dead, and so as Christopher Hitchens pointed out, it proves nothing. You're still holding an empty sack about who Jesus was and what he claimed to be, and you can't say that the resurrection does anything to support those claims. All it proves is by some power he would have come back from the dead, and that's all it would prove. If it didn't happen, either the apostles, the New Testament writers, lied, or what's the other option? They were deceived. They were mistaken, right? They thought he had resurrected from the dead, and they wrote it down like they, and they went and died for it, but he didn't really die, or he didn't really ri uh, rise from the dead. Several things. Yes, they could have lied about it or they could have been mistaken about it. But it's also true that if sincerely mistaken, they would have still done the things that people who sincerely believe something happened would do. People got into aircraft and flew into buildings on 9-11 because of their sincere mistaken belief that this would grant them an afterlife. So from my perspective, people die for falsehoods all the time. So they're dying for this message doesn't prove that it's true. It just proves that they were very sincere in believing it. As for lying, it's quite possible that they did lie for some sort of gain, but I'll save that for later. Now, why are these two things implausible? Well, they had no motive to lie about the resurrection, as we've already pointed out, right? Because all they got, they were beaten, tortured, and killed for saying it was true. Okay, first of all, there is no corroborated historical proof that the 12 disciples died for their faith. There are two claims here, that they were killed and that they died for their faith. One, there is no historical evidence found the disciples after the Gospels to even draw conc that conclusion. There are no historical records at all that they were killed except for the possibility of Peter. John, if we remember, was exiled but never claimed that he was killed. So even from a biblical point of view and a Christian point of view, not all 12 of them were killed for their faith. Only 11. All of the other martyr stories surface much later in church history and we have big problems in proving their historicity. There is also no record of them being given an opportunity to recant their faith at all. That's the second problem. These are the two assertions that no apologist, including Frank here, bothered to prove with historical documentation because there isn't any. Even the account of James's death in Acts only shows that Herod killed him. There is no account of him being asked to recant his faith, just that Herod killed him. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he went after some of the other disciples, particularly Peter. This is the closest we get to the claim by apologists, uh, and it doesn't even have a recant story. The rest, uh, with the exception of Peter and John, we don't really know anything after they're mentioned in the Gospels. I guess seeing you are making charts, it would be nice to have a chart with each apostle's name, the historical account where they were killed, and also with that historical account uh, where they were given an opportunity to recant but didn't. Oh, that doesn't exist. Nice. In fact, they had a big motive to deny the resurrection. They're Jews. They don't want to get kicked out of the temple. They don't want to be excommunicated. They don't want to be thrown out of the chosen people club. 
Why would they do this? Mm, why would they lie? Because it gave them some sort of advantage. It's the same reason why anybody else would lie, or at least a perceived advantage to themselves. But you bring up excommunication like it is a possibility for them. But that is really a Christian idea and a church idea. So I'm going to toss it aside as you're introducing a concept that I am not sure they would have had as Jews. That's more of a concept of later thought, you know, particularly excommunication. They were a part of the chosen people of God, according to them, simply by being born into the people of God. And I'm not sure they would have even had the concept of losing this status. That's something that you're kind of making up here. You don't really know what the motives of the apostles or disciples were. And so you're kind of making stuff up. What concerned them probably, most likely, was who the Messiah was going to be that was going to take them out from under the yoke of the Romans. And, you know, would they have been exalted by being there in their status connected to him? So the idea that Jesus' disciples weren't trying to gain something is actually proven by the Gospels themselves. Two of them asked to sit on the right and left hand of Jesus when he's coming in his power and his kingdom. Many others are thinking, are you going to restore the kingdom to Israel at this time? Several times that comes up. And so they were often, they were definitely thinking about being a part of the messianic you know, promises that they were looking forward to. So there was definitely something for them to gain in this. And so to say that they wouldn't gain something about lying about it, mm, I'm not so sure. Even if Jesus doesn't rise from the dead and it becomes a lie. All cult leaders that lie still have something they feel they can gain. Okay, Are they gaining status? Are they gaining money? There's something that could be gained. And the early church had money at very quickly, as cults often do. That said, there's a third option that you don't address because throughout your presentation you like dichotomies and you know these veered off forks in the road instead of looking at a possible third option. The possibility is that, well, People could have been sincerely mistaken, and some of them could have been lying. In other words, both. It's not possibly seen that the nature of cults have some that sincerely believe and others, for whatever reason, attach themselves to the sincere believer and often lie to say that they do believe, even though they don't. Could they have been mistaken? Well, they had no expl uh, expectation of a resurrection. They weren't expecting a resurrection and then maybe saw him and assumed he had risen from the dead when he really hadn't. They weren't expecting it. Excuse me, Mr. Turek, but didn't Jesus predict his resurrection several times in the Gospels that he would rise from the dead? Didn't he, didn't he say that? It was actually stated in the Bible when he did these predictions, and the disciples at that time, of course, didn't remember that he said these things until after he had been raised. That's very convenient, of course, and why they can't be used as so-called fulfilled prophecy, because they're written after the fact as post hoc rationalizations. But the Gospels themselves say that Jesus predicted his death and resurrection before it happened as part of the story. So that the idea that there was no implanted idea in the disciples that Jesus would rise from the dead at all is completely biblically false. And if I was a Christian, I would point out that you made a very big biblical error there. According to the Gospels, Jesus implanted this idea himself on several occasions. That's a nice sleight of hand there, Mr. Turek, to not mention this. It is because of this expectation, it is very likely that if anything happened at all that would reinforce this expectation or reinforce this notion that what the apostles said or thought that he said, they would have immediately grabbed onto it such as, say, somebody having a post-traumatic experience where they think they see a risen Jesus Christ. It wouldn't take them very long to believe that if Jesus himself had already implanted the idea as a cult leader that he was going to rise from the dead. This gives us many alternatives at this point, which is why I think you say the idea wasn't there at all. But you contradict the Bible in order to say so. And uh, if... They were mistaken. They could have easily been corrected by enemies showing Jesus's dead body. They could have just gone to the tomb and taken out Jesus's body and said, stop all this nonsense talk about the resurrection. He's dead. They didn't do that. Why? Because he wasn't dead. What? Or the disciples stole and hid the body. The body was put in a mass grave so it would have mingled with the dead. These are the two biggest alternatives I can see right off the top of my head. The type of stealing and or hiding the body is very possible. The only one that contradicts this idea is the Gospel of Matthew, where that gospel relates the story of a Jewish leader buying off the guards to tell the story that the disciples stole the body. 
So a claim story countered by another claim story. Funny that the other gospel writers don't include it, and there's no historical evidence to support the story. Add on to that that Matthew is highly likely not to be written by an eyewitness of the witness of the event, and we don't know where this story came from. You have a hearsay story that provides no evidence. I mean, even if Matthew did exist and wrote the gospel, how did he get this story? It would have had to have been relayed to him second or third hand, in which case it's still hearsay and we wouldn't include it as any evidence whatsoever. That makes it poor evidence. The body being mingled with other bodies is also reasonable. Reasonable, And even apologists admit that this was a common practice for crucifixion victims. It only takes about 24 to 48 hours for a corpse to become unrecognizable as the person that they were. This is a combination of rigor mortis and decomposition. Add in to the effect of soil and dirt being around the body, and you keep that body condition, say, for, you know, three days, 72 hours. You know, the three days in the tomb, quote-unquote, tomb that Jesus would have been in the tomb, And you would have Jesus as a completely unrecognizable corpse from any other corpse. This also points back to also as the body being stolen. Take that body and bury it somewhere, you know, the disciples doing this without embalming, and suddenly that body disappears in a very short amount of time. Perfect way to create the story that Jesus rose from the dead. And, you know, there's no body to point to, so you can't prove us wrong. Honestly, I feel like this is Frank trying to reverse the burden of proof in a sense. But the real proof that Jesus rose from the dead would have been if Jesus had shown up at the religious leaders' meetings alive and well and said, see, I told you so. Strange that he never does that. In fact, the ascension story becomes a very convenient story to avoid presenting direct evidence that Jesus rose from the dead after 40 days. Seems to me it really did happen, and this is the conclusion. Jesus is Lord, and if Jesus is Lord, then all we need to do is see what he wants us to do right? No, because once again, Jesus rising from the dead does not prove he is Lord. Just that somehow, if it happened, Jesus either had the power or someone else used the power on him to cause him to come back to life. A few points. Number one, Frank offers no proof of the resurrection here, just many claims to back up the claim. If I pressed him to give me evidence for any of these subclaims that he says proves the claim of Jesus rising from the dead, he would be holding an empty sack. Number two, It really shows that Frank and many other uh, people have the mindset of not seeing alternatives that could exist. Cognitive dissonance and confirmation bias really hit people hard, don't they? Number three, this is why I think Frank is a fraud. His presentation here might convince a gullible who already believe or that who never really thought about it, but anybody with a little bit of critical thinking skills and knowledge can see the possible other alternatives and holes in his presentation. There's a reason that Frank spends most of his time talking to college students and no longer debates too many people who really know their stuff. These college students and people that don't know their stuff and gullible people in church are easy marks. Basically then, number four is most of Frank's technique is either to regurgitate things he's already presented. Trust me, this presentation he regurgitates every time it comes up. But he's also the king of non sequitur thinking. He gets people away from the original question they ask and gets onto some other talking point he'd rather talk on. He often uses these questions to springboard to something else that he wants to actually talk about instead of answering the original question. Number five, Hume's proof remains a problem for Frank because there are so many alternatives to this story and despite Frank's attempts, he doesn't eliminate all of them. What's my explanation of how Christianity became a thing and how it became so big? Well, here's my alternative explanation, although there have been many others that are given. I'm going to concede that Jesus possibly existed and that he was an apocalyptic preacher and prophet of the first century. He was either killed by the religious leader of the Romans uh, for something that he did that made the, either the Romans think he was doing insurrection or the religious leaders thought he was doing blasphemy. There were many messianic figures um, at the time. And, and Jesus would have been just another one of them. That's probably one of the biggest problems with Frank's presentation, too, is he assumes that everybody was looking at Jesus of Nazareth, including the religious leaders in the Roman, as somebody exceptional. 
No, there was quite a bit of these people going on. In fact, one of the theories about the Gospels is Jesus of Nazareth is a conglomeration figure of all these stories that were going around about multiple Messianic. Okay, so at some point, one or more of Jesus' disciples has a post-traumatic seeing Jesus alive after the death vision of some sort of, you know, some hallucination. This is very possible. It happens all the time, and it doesn't take much. My former experience among Pentecostals and their miracle stories kind of leads me to an understanding of how quickly miracle stories can grow and get out of hand. You know, I've often used my example of a woman who got prayed for because she had a really severe headache, the headache went away, and suddenly that story became, you know, a couple weeks later, not years later, the fact that she got healed of a brain tumor. And despite my and her efforts to correct the story, that story continued to persist. So once one of those people has a post-traumatic vision of Jesus, and you know Paul later has one on the Damascus Road, although he even admits that he doesn't know what it was, given the atmosphere, the other disciples also begin to see Jesus alive after the dead sorts of visions and hallucinogenic experiences. It doesn't require a mass hallucinogenic experience, just a few people to have one. And then they start relating their stories, and then other people begin to relate their stories, and you could also see that some people, in order to be accepted by the group, make up their own stories of their own appearances with Jesus and tell those stories. This all begins to have the effect of reinforcing everybody's faith that Jesus is risen from the dead. Most people in this group don't actually see the risen Jesus, and so they just keep going forward. The claim by Paul later that 500 people saw him alive well, Paul makes that claim before any gospel is written, and later on the gospel writers include that 500 number. But are they referencing Paul just to reference Paul? The point of the matter is we don't really know anything and anybody can na name a number. So this isn't really good proof either. The creed in 1 Corinthians just doesn't help us because it's just Paul relating what he's heard, not what he's verified. You, What you want to believe becomes true and more and more true and the disciples begin to tell these stories. The body being buried in a mass grave or stolen and buried would have helped these stories as Jesus being unrecognizable as a corpse would have been, you know, he would have diminished very quickly and eventually the body would have been out of mind because after all, he's been resurrected from the dead. This actually poses a problem for the believer, not the unbeliever, because it's quite possible that the body disappeared by very natural means very quickly back then. And so it's really up to them to produce a risen Jesus, not me for to produce, uh, me or the religious leaders to produce, produce a corpse. This plays into the hands of the disciples' stories, but it doesn't prove any of those stories at all. <clears throat> the stories circulate for decades, growing in the telling, and people start writing them down, and the Gospels are written as collections and start circulating, and these grow in the telling as well. You see this in the 30-plus Gospels that weren't canonized, you see, if you put them in timeline order, that the stories of Jesus continue to grow and become bigger and bigger like any growing legend story. And so Jesus becomes a growing legend. The church has these struggles of trying to define what Jesus really is, but they don't really know either. Various councils, church fathers try to put stuff together, and the cult grows once it makes it shift from an immediate apocalyptic event to some a future apocalyptic event that, well, nobody really knows. And so it becomes very quickly that this group of people glows. It's interesting that the Jews tend to go back into their Judaism, whereas the Gentile believers stay because through this Christianity cult, they are actually offered some hope outside of being the chosen people. Eventually, Christianity grows and spreads across the Roman Empire. And eventually, it gains political support in the form of Constantine, Many other religious leaders, slowly but surely, the Roman emperors and the Roman nation begins to embrace Christianity. And this is what causes its great success. I submit to you that if any other cult, any other religion had become the religion of the empire, we'd be following that religion today. It would have changed nothing. So that's my explanation of how this could have grown. And notice I didn't require a miracle of a resurrection. And that's kind of the point. The fact that there still remains alternatives to the resurrection of Jesus Christ that are very naturalistic, the purpose isn't to say this is what happened. I think, for instance, with Paul Agia's minimal witness theory, a lot of the Christians, well, that's, he has no proof that that happened. That's not the point of a naturalistic explanation story. The point is to show how, without a resurrection, it could have happened and is very plausible. The fact is, if you're going to claim the miracle of the resurrection, there needs to be zero 
I repeat, zero alternative explanations to prove the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That there's only one explanation. And the problem is, Frank doesn't do that, and nor has any other apologist proven that there are other naturalistic explanations to the resurrection. So that's the video for today. I'm, of course, always interested in what you have to say, so make sure you leave your comments and your thoughts in the comments, please. I appreciate that. Every like, share, and subscribe is appreciated. If you want to support the channel in a more tangible way, uh, there's always Super Chat, Super Thanks. Uh, my PayPal link is in the description. Always appreciate those. Thank you very much. Uh, it really supports me and allows me to continue to do what I do. Uh, but the biggest thing, of course, is membership. For $2 a day, you can become a citizen of the Rabid Nation, move from you know being a normal plebeian and become a citizen with the rights and privileges thereof. But also, it supports me and helps me to worry less and less. Every member I get makes me worry just a little bit less about the YouTube algorithm. And, and thank you for that support. I appreciate it. And so here's to my citizens, to my Rabid citizens, to my Tribunes. Thank you very much. You guys are awesome. Thank you for your continued support. And as always, you know... You know, live your best life. You only get one go around and then it's over. So you want to take all your time, money, and opportunities into building up yourself, building up the people you love and care for, and to make this a better world. And don't waste them on the trappings of religion and faith. That's a dead end. I speak from experience. And as always, thanks for stopping by, and I'll catch you next time.